Okay, good. So uh, we have a we aren't going to start for about ten minutes. The official stuff. I just like to talk about the news. In the meantime, here's a few fun things. Um, there's a book called How Democracies Die, which I think is very interesting. I mean, I lived through the last time we went through all this with Richard Nixon, and we're going through the fall of another president, in my opinion, although I'm not alone in that. And it's interesting to see what they do. I think um, this is an interesting article. I mean, an interesting. Uh, it used to be considered that democracies died when you had like a communist takeover with violence and they kill the people leaders and put in fascist leaders. And he says, that's not really how it happens anymore. Now it tends to happen the way it's happening here, where just by inches, you just abandon the rule of law, you abandon your intelligence agencies, you abandon uh, trust in the voting system until you just sort of slide smoothly into a system that's very far from democracy. And that seems to be where we're going. Another thing he says, which I like very much, which is this is not Trump's fault. Trump is a symptom. I mean, uh, Trump is a lunatic, and I don't support him at all. I don't want him in charge. But my problem is not Trump. There have always been people like Trump. They never could win the White House before. My problem is why in the world did so many people vote for him? He didn't just get the Russians to hack the voting machines. A bunch of people really voted for him. So that means we have a large portion of the American public that have an entirely different concept of how the government should be than I do. And, and that troubles me. And uh, anyway, so it's an interesting article, fun if you're interested in politics, talking about how this happened. And what's interesting is a lot of Republicans are quitting because Trump is not a Republican. He doesn't push the Republican agenda. He violates many of their fundamental principles. And yet now Mitch McConnell says this is the greatest year for conservatives in all 30 years I've been here. So it's, it's a complete sellout to whatever works. Anyway, it's interesting to read this and um, talk about what might possibly be done about it. And we will see. But... Uh, we're definitely living through, this is going to be a big time in the history of America. This is like the Vietnam War. This is going to be one of the big turning points when the whole country is different before and after. And uh, the people trying to figure it out now have a certain insight, and a lot of it nobody will really understand until a couple decades later, where they can look back with the wisdom of history. Anyway, so this is, uh, everyone's, everything's going to be self-driving. Self-driving cars are already in all the major cities, including San Francisco, and pretty soon you're going to be able to buy them, I think as early as next year. And so um, one, the problem is, how safe are they? And um, the biggest problem is cyclists, which is also a huge problem for humans driving cars. The problem is cyclists are kind of small, and they move kind of erratically, and they don't look much like a car, so it is pretty easy to not see them. And a lot of them get hit all the time, I've been a cyclist for years, and uh, the cars, you know, it is pretty dangerous in that regard for cars. Um, and so AIs are no different. They have huge trouble identifying cyclists. So anyway, one proposal that's come out is to make all the cyclists wear a radio beacon, which will go to the cars so they will know to dodge you. And this guy thinks that's a terrible idea because, of course, what if you don't have the beacon? And why should you discriminate against cyclists and make them wear a beacon? And, of course, if everybody had a radio beacon all the time, that would – be an interesting way to make the system. It would sure make it a whole lot easier, but then what a nightmare when your battery dies. Suddenly every kind just runs over you because it can't see you anymore. But anyway, it's an interesting issue and we're, we're headed there. Um, no simple answers. This one's interesting. Um, the Russians are supposedly making an intercontinental ballistic torpedo that will go through the ocean and blow up American port cities. And that is a pretty interesting idea. It used to be missiles that go up high, but if you did it under the ocean, it would be hidden. So I don't know if this is true. Um, if you didn't live through the Cold War like I did, you, you may not know that the military makes this stuff up all the time. Um, they always say the Russians are doing something. Uh, there's a time when it was the Russians developing ESP and supernatural powers and magic and stuff. And the U.S. had to make compet competing magic. And if you see um, that, that was real, a bunch of they really did that. Uh, the CIA really had the Department of Magic trying to use tarot cards and occult and witchcraft and uh, ESP to counter the Russians' efforts because you, if they could really do that, that would be awesome, and we would totally need a countermeasure. Um, anyway, so, but anyway, it's an interesting idea, interesting to read about. Um, not entirely clear what we should do about it, but certainly one of Trump's big ideas is to increase our nuclear arsenal, which is something many people for decades have thought is not a good idea. But Trump loves the nuclear arsenal, and we're, we're increasing ours now. So this is part of the uh, justification for it. Ethereum is the general purpose blockchain that lets you put any program you want on it. So you can put a lot of games on it. But um, as I mentioned in the first lecture, everything in cryptocurrency is pretty much crooks. The point of cryptocurrency is to baffle you with some complexity so you feel sort of stupid and then pick your pocket while you're confused. Um, so they've made a lot of gambling systems in cryptocurrency. And now 
this guy went in and he found out the same thing I found out when I looked at Android apps, that if you have a bunch of developers, a large number of them do not know what they're doing at all. And in particular, a large number of people writing gambling apps do not understand random numbers. So they just use something stupid for the random number to shuffle the cards, and it's predictable. And he found, she went through the open source. Uh, that's another good thing about Ethereum. Everything on Ethereum is public. So you can see the source code for anything that's running. And so he went through it and he found um, there are 72 random number generators and 43 of them are vulnerable. So he talks through various things you can do wrong. Ultimately, the fundamental problem with random number generators is entropy. You have to have some number to start from that is unpredictable. And yet computers don't have anything about them that's unpredictable. So you hunt somewhere for something that might be unpredictable. So people use things like a hash of a block on the blockchain, which is how the numbers game used to run in New York City. I don't know if it still does. They would take like the last two digits of some price on the stock market, which was supposedly impossible to control. And that would be the number you gamble on. But of course, that's something that can be observed by someone else. Another thing he says is better. Some of them use a future block on the blockchain, like 10 blocks ahead for the random number. Um, and hopefully that's unpredictable. But then he says there's a way to control the order in which blocks are processed and trick it into processing that block before this block so you find out what the number is. So anyway, it's, it's interesting. Uh, this is a very difficult problem. Security in general is a very difficult problem. And almost everything people code is insecure at first. And they have to add more and more confusing things to it that the original developer doesn't really understand to make it secure. Um, and uh, cryptography is probably the worst. You can write a cryptographic routine that seems fine and has a terrible flaw. That's usually what happens. You really have to be very careful with cryptography. It's very easy to leak out secrets. So this is Troy Hunt. Troy Hunt is an Australian researcher, Microsoft oriented. He does a lot of online courses. He's a very smart guy. He does a lot of very good things, writes a lot of good articles. And this one here is about the ease of disclosure. I've given talks about this at Hope. If you find a security problem in somebody's product, which will happen all the time, once you learn how to do basic security reviews of things, typically there is no way to tell them. Nobody cares, nobody wants to hear. If you, can, if, if you contact the company, you will just get someone that will say, are you buying our product? If not, just go away. Um, if you do reach somebody, they will typically punish you, or blame you for it, sue you, say you're hacking them, say you're extorting ransom. So most professionals, the general advice I've been told by all professionals, and I've come to realize this is the correct advice, which is if you see someone have a security problem, just shut up and let them get hacked. That is the professional thing to do. Because if they are too stupid to have a bug bounty program or, security, or an official security disclosure policy, then they are too stupid to talk to. They will never understand you. They will never fix it. Nothing good will come of getting involved. Um, but a lot of us can't resist the temptation, and I've done it hundreds of times. Anyway, so he talks about it here, and he has the latest proposal. You should have a security.txt file telling people how to report. Um, you know, and slowly, more and more companies are beginning to have some way of reporting vulnerabilities. And I'll just mention, in case you didn't see it before, I've got one, a disclosure policy. If you hack me, that's fine, and I have, everybody should have this. You should have, what to happen if you find a security problem on my site? I've got one. The college doesn't have one. Um, but anyway, I do specify here, what you can do if you find a vulnerability, and this is legally binding. I promise not to prosecute you for reporting vulnerability to me if you adhere to these guidelines, which I got from Bug Crowd or someplace which are good. And they say, you know, just try not to hurt anybody, give me some chance to fix it, and then I won't prosecute, which is what I think everybody should do. But it's very hard to get past a corporate management because this involves opting out of a legal protection the law gives me. The law gives me the right to prosecute anybody who does anything on my site that exceeds my perceived terms of service. So I could say, you went and put an apostrophe in the URL, and that's not something a normal student would do to see a lecture, therefore you're a criminal, I'm gonna prosecute you. And the law would let me do that. I probably couldn't win in court, but I could certainly have some justification for claiming you'd broken a law, and now I won't. If you obey this policy, I have promised in writing not to punish you. And that is something that's hard for corporate managers to understand is that actually the law is harming you and choosing not to be protected by the law will make you more secure. That's hard to explain. It's true, but it's hard to explain. Anyway, um, all right. If you're using Flash, it's got another horrible hole. It's had nothing but horrible holes for decades. Um, I don't know if anybody's still using it, but if you are, it's, it's uh, got remote code execution so people can totally take over your machine, which is pretty much business as usual. I think Flash is pretty much over. Google now says they can predict when your flight is going to be late, which is 
quite reasonable to me. I mean, Google knows the weather everywhere. They know how crowded the roads are. They hear all the news. They even know news before it hits the news media. They can keep track of what terms people are querying. So if there's a gunshot in a city, a bunch of people will start querying about gunshots in Google, and they'll know before the, anybody else does. So it does make sense that if they look through all the data they have, they could tell when your flight's going to be late. So they say with 80% probability, they can predict when your flight's going to be late before the airline tells you. I don't know if that's true, but it's quite plausible, and it does remind you of the big brother issue. Google knows everything about everybody, and they have artificial intelligent machines, and they can predict, you know, they pretty much can see your whole life, which is an issue for people who are worried about privacy and such, but it's the way the world is. And if you don't like Google knowing everything about you, I think you're hoaxed. Uh, unless you want to go to a country with no internet access and live there, or join the Amish, that would be a thing to do. Uh, grow apples and get horses and live in a world without technology is about the only thing you can do to prevent Google from knowing everything about you. And they're going to spy on you with satellites and know everything you see everywhere you go with your horse. Even then, I don't know what you can do. Anyway, um, so this is kind of fun. The web application penetration testers make supposedly a hundred grand and up, which I imagine is true. And if you went to the job fair, they were, there was one company they were hiring pen testers. And they were hiring interns, the NCC group. And I remember other people said they would pay money and they mentioned salaries like 15 bucks an hour or 30 bucks an hour. And the NCC guy said, uh, we're going to pay a lot more than that. I don't know if they're promising to pay you a hundred grand, but pen testers get quite a bit of money. Yeah. Yeah, that's what somebody reports. Um, you got me. You got me. I don't know. It might well be that they just put up a survey and only one person answered in that state or something. You know, I don't know their procedures here. So take anything like this with a grain of salt. What's that? It's near DC. That could be. <coughs> yeah, not West Virginia. That's why I'm real weak on geography. I kept wanting. So I can't tell you. Anyway, all right, so it's time to get up to the official stuff here. Uh, we're on chapter three. So let me bring that up. And uh, all right, got a few things to do here. Okay, so uh, we're down to the computer attacks. Last time we talked about the basics of networking. And so here's some stuff. We're going to talk about uh, malware, uh, what the normal uh, news media call viruses, which includes viruses and other types of attacks, if you want to use the technically correct term. Um, and we'll talk about the defenses such as they are and some physical attacks. The right term for anything bad on your computer is malware, some kind of stuff that does harm. Uh, this is what most people mean when they talk about viruses. Technically, viruses are one particular old kind of malware that spread a certain way, um, but most people prefer to use it because they think of the biological world, where it's like the cold and spreads around. Um, and these are things that do something bad on your machine, typically destroy data, render the machine unavailable, cause a shutdown, steal your data, the sort of thing that you don't want happening. Uh, viruses are technically the things that were attached to an executable file and that reproduce when you run that file. And these were popular in the age of floppy disks long ago, when you would put files on a floppy, take it to another machine and plug it in. And when you run it off that floppy, it'll infect all the other things on there. This was the original kind of virus. And that particular kind of virus is pretty much extinct because floppies are pretty much extinct. That's not how people transmit programs that much anymore, but they do still exist. Um, antivirus software was intended for that threat, but most antivirus software now tries to detect all types of malware. Um, and it will run something on your machine, which has to hook itself into the heart of Windows called the kernel. And now if you try to double click on a file, which ought to launch it, the antivirus engine has to grab that action away from the operating system and scan the file to see if it's on a list of bad files. And if it is, not open it. This means that antivirus software has to alter the fundamental process of the heart of your operating system. And therefore, if your operating system has any security measures, the antivirus software can subvert them. And this is why Tavis Ormandy at Google has spent the last five years analyzing the security of antivirus software. And he has found, like every other category of software, that since they have not been examined previously by competent uh, auditors, they have been doing god-awful, horrible things. And he could take over machines right through the antivirus. Sophos on the Mac, he could totally take over your machine right through the antivirus because the antivirus gives itself permission to mess with the heart of your system, and therefore, it's another threat avenue. However, this does not mean you can get away without using antivirus on a Windows system. 
Most people are much better off using antivirus. That is my personal opinion, although I cannot prove it with statistics. So most people should run antivirus. If you have Windows or Android, there are so many low-level attacks out there that you will stop them by running antivirus. But you should be aware that the antivirus software itself has weaknesses. And, there's a, and now, um, like every other category of software, competent researchers are pointing out the flaws in it, and it's, having, it's causing upgrades. So, you know, they, you shouldn't expect it to be any better than your word processor or your browser or your operating system or anything else. Everything is just written by normal humans, and a bunch of the code they use was inherited from 10 years ago when nobody thought about security at all. So everything is all full of horrible mistakes, and it takes a long time to clean them all up. So... There are a lot of viruses out there, Gumblar and Slob and names like this. They spread throughout the world. Um, there are various ways to evade tools. One way we talked about before is Base64 encoding, where you take files and encode them with capital letters and plus and minus and numbers and lowercase letters. And the only point of this is it'll scramble something, and a sloppy antivirus engine won't detect it anymore because it'll look different. Um, antivirus products claim that they look at a series of code bytes that will identify the virus, but in fact, a lot of them do appalling things. Uh, they had a contest at DEF CON about five years ago to sneak malware past antivirus. And I started doing it with Python, and it is much, much, much easier than you would ever believe. And there are cases where all you have to do is right-click on the file, go to properties, and change the name of the author, and now it passes through the antivirus, because all they were doing was looking at the name of the author instead of looking at any important part of the file. Um, and this is because, not simply because the people that write the antivirus products are lazy or stupid, although that contributes something, but the other thing is <coughs> people hate false positives. If you have a false negative, a few viruses get through, most people won't notice or care. If you have a false positive, you try to run legitimate software and your antivirus blocks it. That really annoys people. So they have to set the sensitivity very low, so it will never block a legitimate application or the customers won't put up with it. And that means it has to let a lot of bad guys through. So uh, that's how you encode the base 64. If you have Oracle up here in eight bits per, per, per byte, it's this string of binary. And if you break it up six bits at a time, the first six bits of this byte go here, and the first two bits, last two bits go here, and the first four bits of that go here. So this a string of characters turns into T1JBQ0XF in base64. It is not encryption. It is trivial to reverse if you know what's going on, but it will make it look different. And this is what people use. Microsoft uses this to hide your Internet Explorer favorites in the registry to supposedly protect your privacy. Or to no, then you use Roth 13, which is even dumber. Um, this is how um, base this is how basic authentication sends your traffic over the internet. Uh, this is a way to make it so you can't trivially read the code, but anybody that knows the system can easily reverse it. This is called obfuscation, where you make something a little bit hard to read, but you haven't really encrypted it. If you've encrypted it, that means it should be difficult or impossible for someone who is unauthorized to read it. And obfuscation just makes it look like it's encrypted, but it isn't. This is true of a lot of supposedly encrypted products like Cisco passwords. Cisco configuration files are typically posted in publicly available forums, and the default Cisco encryption routine until about eight years ago was one that was just obfuscation. It would look really encrypted. It would take your password and turn it into something about 100 characters long. But it was just a trivial, reversible routine like this. Um, and people thought it was encrypted, so they would publish these files everywhere. I found a major healthcare provider who just published that file publicly. And I went through backdoor friends of friends to inform them that your password has now been published on the web. And uh, the response I got back was, that password is not a security boundary, which is code for, uh, we'll fix it, but we don't want to admit anything was wrong. Because um, passwords are, of course, security boundaries, but it is not considered, it is not wise in the American legal system to ever admit you did anything wrong. So you have to lie. That's how the game is played. Anyway, um, so there are base 64 decoders out there. A shell is the most common thing you're getting from malware. This is something that gives the attacker remote control of your system, and we're, we're doing it in the uh, exploit development class. Let me just uh, mute these guys. There was a problem in a previous recording where I was not at the keyboard, and these guys were all miserable because they were irritating each other, and I didn't know, so I try to remember to mute them. Um, macro viruses are very easy for the attacker to write. They're written in Visual Basic, and Microsoft Office has a recorder 
where you don't even have to know any coding at all. You can turn on the recorder like a cassette tape recorder and then do things that will record it and stop it, and then you can play it back. So you can write a virus that way without even knowing any coding, um, and that's the way that some of the early ones were, like Melissa and the I Love You Worm, that would send a copy of itself to everybody in your Outlook um, address book and then reformat your C drive. You could do all that with basically no programming skill at all. So um, a lot of people can create macro viruses. There are instructions all over the place. Some people think I shouldn't be teaching this class or ones like it. This all started about 12 years ago. A guy in Canada had a programming course in writing viruses. And everybody screamed and yelled about whether that was a good idea or not. But I said, hey, I could start writing. I could start teaching hacking. A couple of years later, I started doing it. Um, anyway, you do have to think like attackers to protect people just like military people have to practice attack to understand defense. And people have pretty much given up screaming and yelling about that now. Um, so the Angular exploit kit is one of the many exploit kits out there. Oh, and I think I've got the wrong, no, I got the right version. Okay, just have another pay slide coming up pretty soon. So the, there is exploit kits go out there. These are what they sell to the bad guys. Zeus was one of the early ones. Um, you actually pay a license fee and you actually get a product key and they actually turn it off if you don't have a valid product key. The underground criminal economy is just a mirror image of the above ground economy. And they'll sell you the kit and you can make malware and you can even distribute it and you don't even need to know anything. You just choose off a menu. I want to distribute cryptocurrency miner. I want it to do this. I want it to do that. It makes the stuff and deploys it. There are also Russian websites that I've openly advertised that for 300 bucks they will hack anybody you want as long as they're not in Russia. And they're vigorously defended by the Russian government who feels that this is perfectly fine as long as they do not attack targets inside Russia. So that you can say, I want to take over this company. I want to attack that, or I want to DDoS them for three hours or something, and they will just do it. They'll send you something. Okay, click here. That will happen. You pay the money, they'll just do it. So uh, this is how the underground economy has become specialized because people who know how to write a virus or an attack are mostly uh, nerds that spend all their time in Ida Pro and reading assembly code and stuff, and that's fine, but they don't know how to run a business. Same thing. So there's one group of criminals writing attacks, another group of criminals figuring out how to weaponize them, and another group of criminals figuring out how to profit from them. And they have a distributed management structure on the dark side, just like the light side. So the managers that have figured out how to get rich typically do not know how to write the code. So they hire someone else to write the code and get a kit from them, just like the other guys do. They have exactly the same pressures causing um, a level of management structure because it's a totally different skill to figure out how to get rich from something than it is to figure out how to write a virus. And there's no reason to expect the same person to have both of those skills. So here's, here's one that came out just a couple days ago. Somebody wrote Autosploit. Um, Metasploit has had a few of these. Metasploit's what you're using in Project 3 and several other projects. <coughs> and a lot of people are mad at Metasploit. Um, and by the way, Metasploit code has been used in quite a few real viruses. The bad guys are totally reading and copying it. Um, so some people think we shouldn't be distributing any attack tools, but we are. And so this guy wrote a tool that will take... Uh, it will contact Shodan. Shodan is a search engine of the internet that searches not the content of pages, but the servers. It finds out what version of what operating system and what software you're running on a server and fingerprints that, and that's all it tells you. So you, it tells you what all the devices are connected to the internet, what brand and model and what version of everything they have. So if somebody publishes a vulnerability in some product, you can now go to Shodan and find all the web connected versions of that product that are out there. So this tool will automatically Go to Shodan, find vulnerable sites, and automatically hack them with Metasploit. And the reason people complained about it is that this has no apparent legitimate purpose. I mean, the legitimate pen testers are trying to hack into one company. This just finds random people on the internet that are vulnerable and hacks them. And this is what script kiddies do. They'll put their name on like a thousand WordPress blogs. By a WordPress vulnerability comes out, they find the people have it updated. They update, they infect 10,000 random bird presses, and now their name is out there. They don't really benefit from this in any great way, although smart ones do learn how to make money from it by then taking them over and selling them as a DDoS army or something. But anyway, it's, it's something you would do if you're a criminal. You don't care who you hurt. It's not something a legitimate professional would do as part of a pen test. And it did lead to quite a bit of people yelling and pointing fingers at each other. Um, in America, it's probably legal to write this tool and release it. Um, my lawyer tells me if you do anything and it has any good side, it's okay in America. Uh, if you say anything, free speech will cover you unless it's totally malicious. And so people that wanted to actually prosecute someone for this, which I've not heard anyone say, 
would have to claim that this is totally malicious and has no beneficial side. And uh, if that's true, then it's like yelling fire in a crowded theater, and that is the limit of free speech. You are not allowed to say things that just cause harm and have no good side. Anyway, um, so worms are what most, yeah. Um, so the information that's on Shredex, is it possible to obscure yourself from Shodan so that <coughs> yes. you can type some vulnerabilities Yes, I'm glad you mentioned it. And I put that on news. Uh, somebody wrote a tool, all Shodan scans the internet from four known IP addresses. So all you have to do is block them in your firewall, and then Shodan will not scan you, and you will not appear on a list, which, by the way, is a pretty good idea. Yet one of the basic things you could do at your firewall, you should do at every company, is block Shodan and block Tor. Tor is the anonymity network. There are a small number of people out there who have political desires for anonymity, and they are legitimately accessing your site through Tor. But for every one of them, there's a 1,000 criminals that are doing something rotten over Tor. So if you're a company and you just want to serve customers, you're generally best served by not letting anybody come in through Tor. Um, and uh, the same thing, I think you block Shodan because it can't really benefit you. It's a good point. Anyway, so worms are what really uh, most modern attacks are. These are things that replicate through the internet by email or downloads or something. And that's how people typically get software these days. They don't move floppies and CDs around much. The code red worm spread through the whole world in a short amount of time. Um, and uh, there's other worms. There's attacks against ATM machines. The headlines have been getting uh, uh, jackpotting attacks lately where you actually open the box and, change, and probably get a USB drive or change the hardware. And that's one way to do it, of course. But there have also been just straight up computer viruses with software that attack ATM machines because ATM machines and voting machines are typically Windows XP machines with software running on them. And that makes them vulnerable and they're typically connected to the internet. Everybody does this because the convenience of being able to remotely administer it exceeds the uh, risk of the fact that it's all connected to the internet, but it does make a lot of people nervous. Voting machines, I think, are not generally connected directly to the internet yet. That's a bit too extreme even for them. But almost all voting machines, um, computerized voting machines, have been proven to be terribly unsafe. And um, that last year at DEF CON, they had a voting machine village where people hacked voting machines. They hacked every current voting machine in just a few hours. Um, and so the voting machine industry responded not by improving the machines, but by locking down the sales channels so they can't buy any more machines to test this year, which is typically how industries respond. And I used to be frustrated by this, uh, but this is just the natural response of every authority figure. If you are the head of an authority of an organization like the Catholic Church, and someone comes and tells you something you really don't want to hear, like people that said your priests are sexually abusing people, it is so much easier to just punch them in the face and carry on than to actually listen to them and fix the problem. That would be really expensive. Whereas if you just tell this kind of shut up, then everything's fine again. You can keep going. That is so tempting that everybody falls for that for years. They try that until they can't hush it up anymore. And maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it is understandable, given the pressures of authority, why they do that. They've got a huge company. Microsoft did this for years. They said all the hackers should just shut up and not tell anybody about the Windows vulnerabilities. Then we won't patch them and everything will be fine. And they did that for years until 2002 is when they finally couldn't get away with that anymore. Apple tried this. Apple told their tech support people when the first Apple virus started spreading, if people call you and tell you they're infected with the virus, just tell them that's impossible and hang up on them. Do not acknowledge that there is a virus at all because Apple is advertising we have no viruses. And then somebody in Apple tech support leaked that memo to the press. So once it becomes impossible to lie, then they very reluctantly admit the truth because the truth is expensive. And now Macs have viruses and they have to have defenses and all that jazz. It's, um, so that's the way it is. Anyway, so um, there have been a lot of worms out there. Conficker is one of the really big ones, infected a lot of Windows machines, but never really did much harm. It is an example of the inefficiency in the dark side. Conficker infected maybe 20 million Windows machines, had like six upgrades, version after version, and everybody thought something horrible is going to happen when the next version of Configure came out. And as far as anybody can tell, it was never used to do any harm. Didn't steal the passwords, didn't attack anybody. Somebody went to the bother of building a spot net, but they were not able to negotiate selling it to a criminal that would use it for anything. This happens a lot. Just like in the above-ground economy, there are failures in the below-ground economy. Apparently, they marketed it wrong or priced it wrong, or somehow they were unable to ever send this criminal production to anybody who would exploit it for anything. Um, and SQL Slammer. Slammer was pretty interesting. Um, <coughs> that's the one that shut down ATMs. There's another one that was fun. It was actually written by Linux people to punish Windows. The first targeted attack against Windows Update was one of the big 
um, Blaster, I think, MS Blast, that was it. <laughs> and it actually had in the source code, gee, guys, I'm sorry, I'm just doing my job. So it was a commercial company that hired their staff to write a virus. They didn't really want to do it. And it was some attempt to punish Microsoft for their covert attempt to kill Linux, which came out. Microsoft has totally been doing rotten things to try to kill Linux for years, but now they've pretty much given it up and agreed to cooperate with Linux. But for years, they tried to um, fund lawsuits to make people think it was illegal to use Linux, which, by the way, it might be kind of. They kind of have a point that pretty much all Linux device drivers are stolen Microsoft device drivers. Um, uh, illegally copied. That's pretty much true, actually. But anyway, it's not stopped Linux. So Trojan programs are things that lie to you about what they are. They pretend to be a game or antivirus or utility, and they do something bad, like give an attacker um, remote control of your machine. The most common Trojans are fake anti-malware software that pretends to be an antivirus, but it's actually infecting you and doing more harm. Firewalls block traffic. Uh, the old original firewalls just looked at the port number and blocked certain ports. That's the most primitive defense. That is very easy for an attacker to circumvent, and it's pretty weak these days. Um, but you know, there was a time, maybe 15 years ago and earlier, when malware would actually use goofy ports like 6969 and 4661, and if you block those ports, you block the malware. Now everything pretty much goes over 80 and 443 because they've wised up. So that just blocking by port number doesn't do you much good anymore. Um, and you have to um, use a more smarter firewall like a Palo Alto that really looks at layer seven and totally understands everything about the packets and decides it will block things like BitTorrent no matter what port it's on. It looks at the structure of the packet and identifies this stuff as BitTorrent, I don't like it. Uh, the, main, the most common technique for all viruses is DIL hijacking. We do this in the malware analysis class um, and in the exploit development class. Um, Microsoft uses shared libraries. So if you have a program you write and it tries to do something like download a file from the internet. It does, you don't write your code that downloads as a file. You call a Windows system API call that downloads code, and that calls a library that is shared by many programs. So that's unsanitary. That means all I have to do is trick you into using the wrong library file, and you're adding code to your program at runtime that's not under your control. And it's very easy for viruses to trick your program into loading the wrong deal and adding the virus to a program that itself is not directly infected. And that's the most common way it works. Spyware is stuff that watches what you're doing and reports it to somebody else without your knowledge or consent. This is extremely common. The number one form of spyware on the internet is Google. Um, Google has double click. They watch everything you're doing by putting third party cookies on every website. And it is technically legal. It is uh, the guy that just stepped down from Google, the uh, business type CEO said, we walk right up to the creepy line, but no further. They, they judge how much that you think they can get away with. Um, and that's why the internet is free. They are making money by watching what everybody does. Anyway, now, if they're the other companies that are not restrained by the law or civility will do stuff as bad as steal your pins, passwords, uh, every keystroke, and so on. And as far as anybody knows, Google doesn't do that because that's outrageous and illegal and they would go to jail. They do less intrusive ways of spying on what you're doing. Um, uh, spyware and other programs will often pop up a box and lie to you, and when you click no, it'll mean yes. There was quite a storm, and Microsoft did this for Windows 10. If you had Windows 7, it would download Windows 10, whether you like it or not. Then it would pop up a box saying, do you want to install Windows 10? And when you say no, it would interpret it as yes. Everybody got pretty mad at them. That is pretty outrageous for a legitimate company like Microsoft to do, and they did sort of get wrapped in the nose for that. Um, so adware is stuff that puts ads on your screen. This is one very sloppy way to make money off programs. Not that popular anymore. Sometimes people even agree to have ads on their screen for some other purpose, but these things aren't that common anymore. Um, if you want to block these things, it is painful. Your antivirus software and uh, your host intrusion detection system all have a list of known bad things and they block them, but all they have to do is slightly modify the bad thing that will slip through and anything new won't be on the list. So, you know, that's why I say antivirus is very thin, and I've seen studies that say antivirus now stops 3% of attacks. So it sounds worthless, but in practice it's not because there are a lot of those attacks floating around. Um, if, if a targeted person is targeting you specifically, these things are useless. And the same thing's true, like there are cops out there, right? So if people run around guns shooting people, the cops will arrest them, and that's fine for most of us. But if James Bond is after you specifically, you're hosed. The cops are not gonna save you. <laughs> He's going to hide somewhere and shoot you, and the cops will never know till it's over. And the same thing's true of antivirus. It can't possibly handle a targeted attack from an intelligent attacker. It can only stop a mass attack where a million people get a copy of the same thing in their email inbox or something like that. 
So you'll see virus alerts like this telling you it's been detected. All right, so I got a couple of cahoots. And good, we're doing fine on time. Let me bring up my cahoots. Turn on the sound for the glorious cahoot music. And uh, not that my cahoots, 123. For the first one, okay, 123 is gonna be 3A, there it is, okay. So. What's that? Oh, okay, I sound like you got an answer. Here, there's your Kahoot number. Looks like some people have made it. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Oh, if you spell Kahoot wrong, you hit a porn site or something? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's that's true of a lot of things, yeah. They call it typo squatting. Yeah. That's why I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm teaching adults. Because people who teach like high school and grade school they end up in a world of hurt if a bad word appears on the screen or something, and it's very hard to prevent it, you know, like, like somebody could use a bad word for a name, and ooh, if it was high school, I'd be like locked up or something, but it's college, so it's not the end of the world. Although, please don't take that as a challenge. Uh, anyway, um, there's a bad word. I'm getting rid of that one. All right, anyway, all right, so I uh, guess I'll wait a few more seconds. I actually have a piece of paper today, so I can record the winners in a more professional manner. Okay. All right. So I'll wait another 10 seconds. I think we may have enough people. Ah, here they come. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Okay, which threat is attached to an EXE? Okay, those are viruses, good. All right, which threat deceives the user? Okay, that's Trojan, like the Trojan horse. All right, what defense stops traffic on unusual ports? Defense blocks known malware. All right, that's antiviruses. They do have some ability to do heuristic scanning, but typically they mainly work by blacklisting, which is that. Um, technique I've described that tends to miss things. So I got a non two hack and Connor N. I think Connor N might be a real name. The other people will have to tell me who they are at some point, but uh, there's more cahoots coming. And last time I started talking about binary and I didn't, I said I'd work on my cahoots, so I got those ready. So I'm planning to expose, do you a little bit of binary cahoots every now and then to try to encourage you to learn binary. So let me, um, Go to the homework assignment where I have the PDF and 
We'll spend a minute talking about binary. Small doses of math are the best in my experience. Do a little bit every now and then because you can only learn one or two steps a day. If you try to do it all in one day, you get frustrated. So nibbles are how it all starts. If you have four bits, then the number on the right is the number of ones, the next number is the number of twos, the next number is the number of fours, and the one after that is the number of eights. So if you count to seven, one is one, one zero is two, because it's no ones and a two. One one is three, because this, this one here is a one, and the next one is a two. And this is four, one four, no twos and no ones. So this is seven, one four, one two, and one one. So, if you have four bits, you have ones, twos, fours, and eights, and the largest number you can make is 15. That's eight plus four plus two plus one, and 10 is 10, 10, because this is an eight and a two, but nothing else. 1,000 is eight, because that's an eight, no fours, no twos, no ones, and so it goes. That thing is called a nibble, half of a bite, and let's see if you can know your nibbles. So I made a kahoot about nibbles. And it's, let's search for binary. It's in here someplace. There it is, binary one, nibbles. All right, so give it a shot. Good, I think we had 31 before, so. Yeah, a lot of people don't like math, but it's not hard if you do it one step at a time. I had a student that was on the war path about math for years, and then after he left, he went into algebra and got it right, and you know, it's, it's not any harder than anything else. People just get an aversion in fourth grade when someone teaches it to them wrong, and they try to avoid it forever. And you can't totally ignore math. I'll wait another 10 seconds. All right. So, okay, what is that in base 10? 0B is the prefix for binary. So that's a four digit binary number, 0011, a four bit binary number, I should say. All right, that's three, which is popular but not unanimous. This zero B is the Python technique. You usually have some way to indicate that something is binary. So that means no eights, no fours, one, two, and one, one, so you get three. All right. Good, suck at math. He's not living up to his name. Good. <laughs> or her name. So what's this one? One, 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 one. Okay, that's 15, the biggest number, eight plus four plus two plus one, good. All right, how about that one? Okay, that's 10, because it's eight, no fours, and a two. All right, what's seven in base two? One, one, 
4 plus 2 plus 1, and no H. All right? What's 6? Okay, you, um, I see there's a, a stable population of people that are not getting them. Let me just review it. I hope it'll help. But let me know if you want more about this after class. The number on the right is the number of ones. The next number is the number of twos. This is the number of fours. And that's the number of eights. So this is no ones, a two, a four, and no eights. So two plus four is six. That's how it works. Let's try a couple more of these. What's 14? All right, that's almost 15, one shy of 15. What's time? All right, that's eight plus one, that's nine, good. All right, how about that, 12 in binary. Record these winners, Eli, W, Connor, Connor N, that's good, and Louise. All right, so um, let me turn on my sound so I don't have echoing back through my room. And I should mute these guys again so they don't irritate each other. All right, well, we're a little bit before the hour, so let's just do a few more of these slides and then we'll take a break when we hit the hour. Um, we're doing fine with time here. So, that was the math. And why is this thing not moving? All right, so. All right, what's going on with my crazy machine? I guess Kahoot must be bogging it down somehow. Such is life. Wow, neat. So, uh, you have to train your employees. Uh, some people argue it's useless to train your employees and you should just make defenses that work even when your employees are just dumb monkeys that click on everything. Um, but most people think it would be better to teach them something so that they make less mistakes. Anyway, um, various techniques have been used. You certainly have to update all your security products automatically. If out-of-date signatures are no good, most uh, malware spreads through the whole world very quickly in a day or two. And if you have last week's antivirus signatures, they aren't really doing you much good. Uh, Spybot and Adaware are some of the big anti-spyware companies out there. There's a lot of firewalls, um, and there's intrusion detection systems you can put on, and we have more about those in the uh, network security monitoring class. Um, one big issue in this whole business is FUD. Uh, because the internet is confusing, there are a large number of people who lie to you to make you scared and then pick your pocket while you're scared. Essentially, everyone in the cryptocurrency space does this. And before then, it was an incredible number of people in the security industry which scare you. This is now the fake tech support. They'll call you on the phone. Microsoft has detected viruses on your computers. I'm here to save you from India. I just let me have remote control of your machine and I'll scare you to death by showing you something like the event log full of errors, which every machine has or something like that. And then I'll, you'll install our stuff, which for which you have to pay a pile of money, which will supposedly save you from that scary threat. Um, this is not that different than people used to sell charms to people. And I've heard this happens in Chinatown still. They go to some family and say, someone, a witch has put a curse on your family and they're all gonna die unless you buy our magic charm. It's very similar. And you, if people have something they're afraid of, you can get their money this way. So it happens. It happened to the college. 
We hired a crooked chief technology officer who had done this to several colleges before. He had partnered with a friend who claimed to be a security consultant, and he would go to the college, then claim he found all these virus consultants to secure the college. The consultants would then say he found all these viruses, and he would then make a huge scandal, which is what he did. He, he just became a worldwide news story that we had 10,000 machines. They were all infected. They've been infected for 10 years. It was all completely false, and I was at the head of the mob that uh, drove him out because I was the only guy who was out of his chain of command who actually knew something about the security posture here because my students had done audits of the security of the college in my CISSP class. So I knew he was lying and I was willing to stand up and say that. Whereas everybody else who knew he was lying was in his chain of command and afraid to stand up to him. So anyway, it's, um, so intruders attack. One thing, attack is somebody trying to do something they shouldn't be allowed to do. Uh, security is that state when the attacks are prevented, probably not completely, but held down to a level where you can still get your work done. And um, computer crime is, of course, the fastest growing kind of crime in the world. I think it was 2014 was the first year where the amount of money stolen from banks online exceeded face-to-face -face bank robbery. And I see this as a great thing improving the world. Face-to-face -face bank robbery is miserable. Guards get shot, customers get shot, people get run over by getaway cars and cops chasing the getaway cars. It's much better for everybody, including the victims, to do it online. The crooks have a better time, the banks have a better time. This is a civilizing influence as we move away from physical world violence into cyber world violence. Um, anyway, so denial of service attacks are one type of attack where you don't try to steal data or control a machine, you just render it unavailable. This, at first glance, seems pointless. You have to be a little creative to figure out how to get rich from it. The simplest one is just extortion. You take down a site for a weekend, then you say, all right, you're going to pay me protection money, or I'm going to do that again every weekend, and you'll never make any money. That's a big one. People hire online retailers, frequently hire people to take down their, their competitors on holidays. So their site is down, and people will buy my shoes instead of their shoes or something. Uh, turns out there's plenty of ways to make money from this. Uh, and you typically don't test for these vulnerabilities when doing a penetration test because it involves taking things down and most people don't want to uh, <laughs> expose themselves to that. If you want to protect websites, one simple defense is Cloudflare, a San Francisco-based startup that will give you free protection for your website from DOS attacks, which everybody should really be using as far as I'm concerned. Um, DDoS is the most effective type where you take over many machines and they all attack the website simultaneously from many locations. It's difficult to tell from legitimate traffic and it's commonly what's done. And if you, some people like to talk about hacking back, but if you were to attack the person that's DDoSing you, it's probably not the criminal, it's just an innocent victim who got infected or being used. So punch, this is why punching back on the internet is pretty pointless and counterproductive and probably illegal and probably does more harm than good. And most companies, uh, are best just defending themselves and not trying to figure out exactly who's attacking them. Um, the cops want to do that, of course, and the spies want to actually find out who's attacking them and punch them back, but a typical company, there's no real point to that. You just want to put up defenses that stop that type of attack. I mentioned Cloudflare. If you uh, put up a website without Cloudflare, everybody comes to your website, and the bad guys come to your website and use up all the connections, and now you're down. If you're at Cloudflare, they're all looking at a copy of your website on the Cloudflare servers, which are very, very strong and very hard to take down. So even if you have a cheap web host, Cloudflare has a great web host that can take a huge attack. And people will still see your site even when you're under attack. A buffer over, yeah, go ahead. They have a free plan and they have a pay plan. So the free plan is like advertising for the pay plan. And if you pay more, then they stop more advanced attacks and uh, they give you a bunch of advanced protection on it. One of their big customers is uh, StumbleUpon. And so the main, uh, the CEO of Cloudflare, I know him, he's given talks with me and stuff and visited here. He, um, he says there, most people don't even care about this DDoS protection. What most people care about is the fact that your content loads faster because there are Cloudflare servers in every country. And that's what they really, and StumbleUpon is one of their big customers and they provide local uh, redistribution, content uh, you know, proxying. And that's what they care about, is making their site available and fast-loading worldwide. Anyway, um, buffer overflow attacks are what we're doing in exploit development class for starters. This is uh, a problem caused by the language C. C is very close to assembly language. So if you use a variable, you have to first specify how big that variable is. 
And if you later try to put too much data in the box, it doesn't notice or protect you. It just runs over the edge of the box, and the data you put in hits things it wasn't supposed to hit, and that leads to a vulnerability that can let people take down the server or take over the machine. So uh, you're, if you're going to use the language C and produce fast, efficient code, you have to train your programmers to watch out for these things, or you have to run the code through some kind of scanners afterwards to try to detect these mistakes. Um, and that's, there have been many, many buffer overflows. It was the most common form of Windows vulnerability for years and years until maybe about seven or eight years ago. Around the time Vista came out, Microsoft developed some really good defenses that lowered the importance of buffer overflow attacks to where uh, last I saw it was only 5% of modern attacks use this technique. Now they mostly use dangling pointers, which is a different kind of error. But there were just tons and tons of buffer overflow vulnerabilities for a long time. Uh, the ping of death was a, an attack. This is a denial of service attack that comes from a single message, which actually arrives as many packets and is then reassembled. Remember from last time we talked about TCP, you can only move 1,500 bytes at a time. So if you want to send something big, like an image, you have to break out into little chunks to get reassembled. Well, you can maliciously send chunks that don't reassemble correctly. There's a series of attacks like this, the land attack and the fraggle attack. And there are ones, uh, you can make ones where the chunks overlap instead of adding up nicely or the chunks have gaps in the middle. And this one, you just make too many chunks, so it adds up to more than 64 kilobytes of data. And that led to a clash of systems back in the days of Windows 95. They just didn't think of that. So if you sent a ping that added up to more than 64 kilobytes of data, it would assemble it, overrun some buffer, and crash. And so you'd send one ping, and the server dies. That was the ping of death. And this keeps coming back over and over and over again in different forms. A single packet wipeout. There's one at the last DEF CON. On the airport on the way home, I was waiting for my plane, and someone said, you can it SMB Loris, and I got it working right there and put up a video. It was bloody awesome. You could send a server message block request to see a shared resource and do the same thing. Overrun something and <laughs> the server's hose. Um, this keeps on happening. So there was another one in 2013 on IPv6. You could bring that machine with a single ping. And uh, here's how it works. If you want to do this, you can fragment things up. There's a program called FragRouter you can run. And it will break things up. So here, you send a whole bunch of packets. So a normal ping, here's a ping that's 60,000 big. And it will send us a whole bunch of packets, 1,500 bytes each to get reassembled. That's the normal transmission. And if you use FragRouter, which you can do with Kali, this is an old program, this will artificially break things up even more than you have to. So now if you send a ping, it will be in packets that are only eight bytes big, sending just a few eight bytes of data, so thousands of packets or hundreds of packets adding up to it. And the point of this is your network defense systems are typically helpless now because they only see eight bytes of it at a time. And the only way they could defend you is by delaying traffic until they can reassemble the whole thing before retransmitting it, and that's typically an unacceptable network delay. So this is a way to sneak past defenses by breaking your attack into little chunks that are reassembled at the other end. Session hijacking is a technique to take over someone else's session in progress. Typically, after they've logged in, you take over their session, now you execute commands with their credentials. Um, and we talked about that <coughs> last time. The original technique was by predicting TCP sequence numbers. The more modern technique is by stealing a cookie and replaying a cookie. Both of these let you take over someone else's session without their password. You can be interpreted as them by the server, even though you did not really log in. They logged in, and then you took over. Um, physical security is also an issue. I'm thinking it's probably time. Yeah, let's take a break until 10 after 10. I'm going to pause the Zoom at this point. Uh, we'll pick up at uh, 10 after 11. We stop the Zoom. And if you, uh, if you want the Kahoot,